We need a new system. We need a new society. We need to demand that which may have sounded impossible even a few weeks ago, but is not only realizable, but an imperative necessity. Imperialism, racism, and Islamophobia, the toxic mix driving and justifying U.S. wars of aggression. Welcome to this week's episode of The Real Story on the Socialist Program. I'm your host, Brian Becker. Today, we'll be talking to Dr. Nazia Kazi. She is an activist and professor of anthropology at Stockton University, and she is the author of the book, Islamophobia, Race, and Global Politics. Dr. Kazi, welcome to the Socialist Program. I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, Dr. Kazi, you wrote a book, Islamophobia, Race, and Global Politics, in 2018. That's when it was published. It's been republished, a second edition. Uh, Tell us a little bit about the book, why you wrote it, uh, what was the context for your writing, and what's new with the new edition? Sure. So the book was largely motivated by my desire to write something about Islamophobia that didn't focus on sort of explaining Islam and Muslims to a Western audience. Quite often, you'll find really introductory texts on Islamophobia. And my book is an introductory text. It's not a dense academic volume. You know, it's been used in, um, you know, freshman year college classes, community colleges, even, um, you know, high school classes. Um, but the book really tries to connect anti-Muslim racism to sort of empire building, specifically U.S. empire building. And I think sometimes we assume that introductory readers would not be able to grasp that concept. But in fact, I found the opposite. I found, at least in my experiences in the classroom and talking to audiences about my book, um, that Americans are frankly eager to think beyond sort of this attitudinal approach to racism. You know, that approach that focuses on perceptions and prejudices and are eager to think sort of more systemically. Uh, The new volume that just came out a couple months ago has some Um, new information in it as we look back on the Trump presidency. So at the time the book was written, we were just on the heels of the 2016 uh, presidential election, which was one of the most overtly Islamophobic presidential races, uh, both Hillary Clinton and uh, Donald Trump expressing varying forms of anti-Muslim racism. And so in this new volume, we kind of look back at the Trump presidency and we look um, at the burgeoning Biden-Harris administration and what that means, uh, not just for anti-Muslim racism, but sort of for the politics of American empire building. And again, uh, trying to do that in really accessible terms so anyone can sort of pick up the book and read it and grasp its fundamental concepts. Well, let's talk about the Trump years. Uh, Obviously, Trump came into office riding a wave of extreme racist demagogy. Uh, against immigrants and certainly against uh, Muslims. He was making the argument that, quote, terrorists and their families should be murdered by the U.S. government. I mean, obviously, promoting acts which are illegal, violations of the Geneva Convention, violations of international law, crimes against humanity. And he was the Republican Party candidate. And uh, he narrowly won. I mean, he lost the popular vote, but he won the electoral uh, college vote. He got many more votes in 2020 than he got in 2016. It was kind of an anomaly in 2016. But after this anomaly, this freakish event where Donald Trump becomes president of the United States, he actually created a grassroots movement of support around some of these same Uh, political, ideological uh, concepts. And of course, it's not brand new in the United States. The idea that you could pander to a very large, substantial section of the population with what might have been called at one time dog whistles, meaning it was somewhat disguised. You couldn't fully understand the racist messaging. But with Donald Trump, it was pretty much out in the open. So from your point of view, as you've examined this issue over the years, uh, what, if anything, is the lasting impact of the Trump 
uh, presentation on this and the fact that Trump actually gained more support, not less support, uh, four years later. You know, Trump's political career extends well before his sort of formal political career when he ran for president. Um, we will recall that it was, you know, in the 1980s that Donald Trump took out a, a full page newspaper ad calling for New York State to bring back the death penalty in order to execute what were then called the Central Park Five that we now know are the exonerated uh, Central Park Five. So uh, racism has sort of been the cornerstone of his political and public-facing persona. I mean, it was Obama's uh, run for presidency that sparked, you know, Donald Trump casting doubts on where he was born or whether or not he was a Muslim. This kind of racism has a lot of currency in the U.S., particularly as we have aggrieved, you know, uh, poverty-ridden populations that are just, um, frankly, fed up with the political establishment. Now, of course, Donald Trump would prove to be a part of the political establishment. His promises to, quote-unquote, drain the swamp uh, really fell flat as we saw him appoint, you know, ExxonMobil executives to key positions in his cabinet. But as he spoke to the American public as this kind of outsider, he brought with it this, um, I mean, the dog whistle was done under Trump. There was no more you know, racial code words that were used. It was on the campaign trail that he spoke very openly about Mexican migrants being, you know, rapists and criminals. And this was a kind of uh, rhetoric that really shocked the American public. Um, but when it comes to actually the sort of substance of his political career, in many ways, it was indistinguishable from that of Bush or in many ways, Obama before him. Uh, Obama deported far more migrants than uh, Trump would, uh, but he didn't use the same kind of obviously uh, racist kind of language. Uh, now we are looking at a, a viciously anti-immigrant Biden administration that is not sparking the same kind of um, outrage among liberal populations that the Trump presidency did. So while it's certainly true that Trump used this kind of overt uh, racist, xenophobic language. In terms of, you know, policy and practice, he was largely continuing a sort of American systemic racism that has been around for quite some time. Let's talk, and, and I'm sure you cover this in, in great greater detail in your book and now in the new edition, but let's just go over the trajectory of American politics. The, the World Trade Center, uh, of course, was destroyed on September 11th, 2001. But it was bombed earlier than that. It was bombed in the early 1990s, 1993. Uh, shortly thereafter, there was the bombing in Oklahoma City, the federal building. And more than 100 people were killed, including many children. And the perpetrator of that bombing attack, of course, was Timothy McVeigh. He was eventually caught by mistake. And one of the reasons he was caught by mistake is they weren't looking for Timothy McVeigh. The authorities were looking for Muslims. They were looking for brown people. They were looking for people who appeared to be Middle Eastern or heralding from Muslim countries. So it was really very much an accident that he actually gets stopped by a state trooper. A lot of people got rounded up in, in those first hours after the Oklahoma City bombing. So this is the precursor decade to September 11th. A lot of the reason I'm mentioning it is that September 11th is sort of a reference point uh, for this issue of the surveillance state whipped up anti-Muslim hysteria. Uh, but actually, it comes earlier than that. Just talk about that and and the reorientation of U.S. foreign policy again, especially towards the Middle East. Yeah, and we have to remember uh, that uh, Timothy McVeigh happened under, you know, the Clinton presidency, under a Democratic administration. And this was really crucial that, you know, in response to the Oklahoma City bombing, the Clinton administration tightened immigration protocols, <laughs> you know, as if that had had anything to do with the bombing to begin with. It, it, uh, it, it ushered in a kind of surveillance focusing on Arab and Muslim communities that would kind of be a skeleton for what came after September 11th, 2001. Uh, so it's a really remarkable demonstration of sort of how, just how bipartisan uh, 
Islamophobia is in the U.S. It's it's really supported by the two political parties and their establishments. Um, so you know, and the Clinton presidency is certainly an example of what happens when a uh, the Democratic establishment tries to kind of reach across the aisle. I mean, we'll remember that uh, Bill Clinton, you know, secured both of his presidential victories through anti-black racism. I mean, his first presidential win was by uh, talking about himself as being especially tough on crime, executing um, mentally ill black man to, to sort of secure large parts of the Republican vote. And then again in 1996, um, he's up for re-election and he does the same thing. He cuts uh, the American welfare program, uh, largely throwing, you know, I mean, the recipients of what was then welfare were multiracial, black, brown, and white. But he he used this kind of racist idea about welfare uh, recipients to slash welfare spending and then to get himself reelected. So it's not just Islamophobia, right? It's a wide-reaching kind of economic and political racism that shapes both of our political parties' establishments. And what ended up happening as a result of Bill Clinton's Islamophobia in response to 1993, was that in, you know, in the year 2000, and I find this really remarkable, it was the first time that Muslim Americans organized themselves as a block voting population. So this was the first time that Muslim Americans agreed that we're going to vote together and we're going to influence the American uh, presidential election as a group. And who did they vote for? They voted for George W. Bush, right in the year 2000, which is a really remarkable piece of American history that I think is often forgotten. I'm so glad you brought that up because um, after September 11th, I was um, I had been an organizer with uh, one wing of the anti-globalization movement that was planning protests on September 29th, 2001. That movement broke apart uh, after September 11th. A, a good number of the group said this is not the appropriate time to demonstrate. Partly it was based on fear. Uh, there was so much rage and anger, and also the government was rounding people up, especially Muslim people, making Muslims register all over the country. There was a lot of fear. And I was part of the group that went forward with a demonstration on September 29th, 2001. We had 25,000 people, and that was the birth of what became the Answer Coalition. And during that time, and in the months afterwards, uh, we were talking with uh, Dr. Sami al Arian. Uh, who was a professor at Florida State University. He had been the campaign manager or a campaign manager in Florida for the re-election or for the election of George W. Bush. And then uh, he was, of course, arrested by the FBI on framed up charges. Uh, we met with the officials from the Council of American Islamic Relations. We talked to them about doing activities against the war, against Islamophobia we discovered that almost all of them had been working for the Republican Party. And, and partly it was because the Clinton administration had said after, a, uh, after the Oklahoma City bombing that they would uh, go to secret evidence, meaning that the surveillance state and the U.S. government's repressive and coercive institutions would be able to hear secret evidence, and that was going to be targeted mainly against Arab, South Asian, and Muslim people meaning you wouldn't be able to face your accuser. So on that issue alone, when I talked to Sami al Arian, he said, well, that alone was a big enough issue. And yet after September 11th, all of these folks are taken down. So many of the people we were working with went to prison. Uh, there was the Holy Land Foundation Five. This, this, I mean, the largest Muslim charity in America uh, targeted for repression. And those folks are still in jail. I mean, people might think this was the, you know, some, some of the like days past, but no, they're still in prison and they're not alone. Anyway, let's just talk about that phenomena. Yeah. I mean, what you're speaking of, this kind of mass hysteria that swept the nation after September 11, 2001, it's not something we can speak of as entirely having been rolled back, right? So you're talking about folks who were uh, wrongly incarcerated by the security state after September 11, 2001, who remain incarcerated. We know that the programs of you know surveillance and infiltration remain largely intact. And we're talking, you know, two decades after September 11th, 2001. And this is, you know, one of the remarkable features of American militarism is it expands, it, it bloats, and then it has a lot of trouble shrinking, you know, whether or not the perceived 
threat has really passed. I mean, this is an important thing we have to think about with regards to you know, the war on terror. Uh, people joke, you know, con- congratulations to drugs for winning the war on drugs. And we might say the same thing about the war on terror, that the war on terror has been an abject failure. I mean, uh, from what we are witnessing in Afghanistan to, you know, the domestic um, uh, detention and uh, deportation regime that really took shape after September 11th, um, these are things that largely remain intact. I mean, I was stunned in 2016 when there were huge protests led by, you know, primarily by young indigenous people at Standing Rock. And these were protesters who were trying to prevent the construction of of the oil and gas pipeline, the Dakota Access Pipeline, through treaty-protected Native American land. And when they were faced with police dogs and tear gas, it turned out that the company responsible for that was Tiger Swan, a counterterrorism firm, ostensibly designed to protect us from, let's say, Muslim terrorists, then deployed against Native people. I mean, this is really remarkable. I mean, what we call Islamophobia is really something so much more vast than anti-Muslim racism alone. I mean, the tentacles of Islamophobia certainly reach to the U.S.-Mexico border. I mean, you'll recall that after September 11, 2001, uh, the Department of Homeland Security formed, and it absorbed all the functions of immigration policing, right? And immigration control truly became a policing and law enforcement issue since September 11, 2001. And one of the justifications was homeland security, that the U.S.-Mexico border needed to be secured to keep us safe from an attack like September 11. So effectively, what happened was, you know, the kinds of border violence we've seen. For instance, I'm sure your viewers are familiar with what happened to, you know, Haitian asylum seekers just a couple weeks ago. This is an extension of, you know, the security state and the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, So, you know, what we call Islamophobia needs to be understood as having uh, far greater reach than just on, quote unquote, you know, Muslim populations alone. Excellent and very, very important point. In 2011, a decade ago, uh, Wall, uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement started, the Occupy movement. It started September 17th, not far from where we are here in New York City, in Zuccotti Park, down by Wall Street. And, um, you know, 7,000 people, 7, people were arrested between September 17th and the end of December when the government, in a coordinated crackdown, using public health mainly, but not exclusively as a pretext, basically crushed that movement. Afterwards, the Partnership for Civil Justice Fund, uh, the PCJF, using public records requests, FOIA requests, were able to get the documents of the fusion centers. Now, the fusion centers were, as you are alluding to, created in that period right after September 11th. They are, a, um, they are a partnership between the FBI, local police, different intelligence agencies, uh, mayor's offices, and even corporations. And those fusion center public records requests that the PCJF got, in which I helped sort of read along with other activists at the time, there was a huge number of documents. It showed that the fusion centers were being used to monitor and surveil every last act of every Occupy encampment around the country using the authorities and the money that they had achieved in the anti-terrorism sort of authorizations from Congress to surveil and destroy a movement that they said was a peaceful movement. And I think it's so important that under the banner of Islamophobia or under the banner of the war on terror is really what we're talking about, what you're talking about. All of these uh, powers that were aggregated by the federal government were then able to be used against any social movement that sought social change. And again, under the rubric of anti-terrorism. And so uh, it's such a vivid example of exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, I'm glad you bring up Occupy Wall Street. I lived in New York City at the time. I was frequently at Zuccotti Park. And it was one of those times when anyone who might have had any doubts about just how far along the U.S. is as a police state, it just became patently clear. I mean, I remember a protest at John Jay College, City University of New York. It was just a student protest against a tuition hike. Uh, and, you know, a bunch of faculty and grad students and retired faculty joined the student-led protest and were met with 
NYPD officers in riot gear. I mean, batons drawn as if they were trying to overthrow the government. I mean, this was a university protest inspired by Occupy against a tuition hike at what was designed to be a public, free, working class educational institution. And at the end of this protest, I ended up pinned up against a wall behind a police baton. Uh, This was such a remarkable show of state force. Uh, It was at that time that, you know, Occupy Wall Street protesters were calling themselves the People's Army. And uh, Mayor Michael Bloomberg responded and said, I have my own army. And he was referring to the NYPD. And of course, at this time, the NYPD is working with the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, to develop its anti-Muslim surveillance program, the so-called demographics unit, which has since been found to be unconstitutional, in which all aspects of Muslim life, bookstores, coffee shops, restaurants, student groups, were infiltrated, were surveilled, and it led to, the revelations of this program led to such a widespread chilling effect among Muslims, especially Muslim college students who are worried about getting politically involved because they didn't want to get in trouble with the state. And this has a long history in the U.S. You know, I mean, we all remember uh, the COINTELPRO revelations. We know that part of COINTELPRO, you know, the counterintelligence program of the FBI, wasn't just surveilling sort of progressive and leftist movements, but it was surveilling all Black activity. I mean, Black coffee shops, bookstores, there was a whole program of systematic surveillance, um, you know, of of Black communities in ways that uh, would come to life again in a sort of surveillance state that followed September 11th. So you're absolutely right that these kind of mechanisms um, are often used to to repress any kind of dissent, you know, that may surface. Yeah, and COINTELPRO, I want want to ask you about this, whether we witness the same phenomena. In addition to spying and surveilling, it was an actively interventionist program by the FBI designed to uh, create divisions, uh, to try to have groups go to war against each other. If there was any multiracial or multinational unity, uh, the FBI worked overtime to split people up along the lines of race and ethnicity. In other words, it was a movement, it was a, a, a project for disruption. And when you think about what was happening uh, after September 11th, especially, but again, even earlier in the 1990s, but especially after September 11th, it too appears as an interventionist program, not just a spying program by the U.S. uh, intelligence agencies. Again, because I was involved so much in the anti-war movement with the Iraq war uh, and also in solidarity with the Palestinian people, especially after the Israelis reinvaded the West Bank in March 2002, I was at the mosques. I was speaking at mosques. I was talking to young Muslim people who were interested but also afraid And at every mosque, there were security details on the outside, not really, not really trying to protect the mosque from like racists who were coming at the mosque, but really trying to protect the mosque from the FBI or from different police agencies. And again, in the New York City area, the NYPD's budget for anti-terrorism, which was really almost an exclusively anti-Muslim program, although it morphed into other areas. I mean, let's just talk about that. Was it a program of actual intervention, not simply surveillance? I think typically the lines between surveillance and sort of infiltration um, and neutralizing, you know, to borrow from Hoover himself, those lines are really blurry. Uh, I mean, you cannot underestimate the chilling effect that these surveillance programs have had on the political uh, aspirations of Muslims in America. I mean, the number of times, and I write about this in my book, the number of times I've spoken to somebody when I was doing sort of my ethnographic fieldwork, and they would, you know, make a joke, sort of like, we know we know someone's reading this email, so, you know, if, if you want to come too, feel free, like, you know, hashtag at my agent, kind of this banality, this, as Maha Hilal calls it, the banality of surveillance, right? That people are making jokes about it, that they kind of will be, there will be sermons at mosques, you know, on Friday prayers, where they'll kind of reference whoever the agent in the room might be. (laughs) And so Muslim Americans are well aware of this. And I know of a lot of young, uh, politically curious Muslim Americans who are scared to buy a book about a particular topic to watch a documentary, to visit certain news sites because they know their actions are being watched. And whether or not they are being watched, it has that effect, right, of squashing even just political curiosity, let alone political sort of activism, 
and political work. Uh, so this is really, really remarkable, and we can't underestimate that. I mean, I can speak from my own experience, and I don't know whether this is, you know, a random, to put in heavy air quotes, random profiling, or if there's something else going on. But I know when I travel, uh, airports are a really remarkable site of surveillance for me. I've had, you know, uh, secondary screenings more times than I can count, where I am pulled aside and, you know, the items in my luggage are are inventoried, are taken they're taking notes on them in a laptop and I, I don't know what happens to that. Um, you know, so there is this way in which um, surveillance is so far reaching. I mean, it was a few years ago that we learned about the TSA's Operation Quiet Skies, which is a very eerie name for a program in which plain clothed TSA officers were tasked with sort of patrolling airports and looking for suspicious behavior. And if you look at the manual uh, that was leaked, uh, we can see what suspicious behavior includes. It can include glancing at a gate information frequently. It can include pacing around a terminal. It can include making eye contact with people. It can include avoiding eye contact with people. It can include any of the many things we do when we're stuck, bored, our flight is delayed at an airport terminal. So this is, you know, this is the kind of just far-reaching surveillance that we've seen. Uh, we know that the NYPD demographics program infiltrated Muslim student groups in, on college campuses that were even outside of the NYPD's jurisdiction, outside of New York. Um, and these students learned about it. They learned that someone who came on their you know, weekend whitewater rafting trip was actually, uh, actually a cop. So uh, we can't underestimate, you know, the chilling effect of these surveillance programs. And we also can't underestimate just how much that might even be the intention of them. I mean, they're very effective at steering people away from, as I said earlier, even just political curiosity, reading an article, watching a movie, checking out a book. We know that the Patriot Act made it possible for the federal government to monitor what books Americans were checking out from their libraries. I mean, this is really, really remarkable in a country that publicly frets so much about quote-unquote authoritarianism around the world to see this kind of surveillance here at home and barely a peep in sort of public discourse about it. Well, let's just talk a little bit more about the Patriot Act then. Um, on, on page 38 of your book, you write... Um, you write about someone named, named Assad. I believe it's Assad or it's a, Assad who you interviewed for the book. And he's telling you that he didn't want to watch the documentary Dirty Wars on Netflix. And here's what you write. Assad or Assad understands that they, they in quotes, keep records and that they could get him in trouble just for watching a movie. Assad was right. Consider Section 215 of the Patriot Act, which allowed the FBI to secretly monitor the library books people were checking out, endangering library users' constitutional and privacy rights. Now, just I want the audience to really think about this. You have 19 hijackers who, who hijacked four planes and drive two of them into the World Trade Center and one of them into the Pentagon and the other is taken down. So you have these individuals who carried out the September 11th attacks and the response by the government is to pass the Patriot Act that allows the FBI to go to libraries in every town and city in the United States and to find out who's taking out what books as if that could possibly be used as a justification to, quote, keep Americans safe. And also, at least in the initial phase, I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it's been a while, the librarians, if librarians reported that the FBI had come to find out who took out what book, they themselves would be um, culpable. They themselves would be held to, uh, to uh, criminal liability. Anyway. What happened with the Patriot Act? And, and again, as we talked about earlier, when the government aggregates power against people's rights, it's rare, maybe never, that it gives that, that power back to the public. You know, uh, the example about the librarians who are kind of concerned about the overreach of state power is an important one. Uh, you will recall that shortly after September 11, 2001, uh, George W. Bush told Americans, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. I mean, this is 
exactly what we mean by the repression of dissent. You know, this was a climate of such heightened fear. And it was fear that was stoked. It was fear that was created. You know, the 9-11 attacks were the most broadcast and replayed uh, live television event in human history. And what ended up happening was Americans sort of were, by and large, eager to trade their protections, you know, their, their, their legal rights for what they saw as protection from terrorism. And so this war on quote unquote terror will notice is a war on a feeling. And as long as people feel terrorized, they will continue handing um, you know, blank checks over to that which claims to protect them from terror. I think, I think we should be terrorized. I think we should be terrified by the looming threat of climate change, by the looming threats of medical and student debt, by the just, you know, the concentration of wealth in a small number of hands. I mean, I think these are the threats that we're not allowed to think about. And this is why the Patriot Act was able to pass so quickly. I mean, such a long and dense document that was produced like that you know, and was uh, signed on with largely with bipartisan support um, because of this climate of fear. Um, The Patriot Act also contained provisions about clandestine searches, the so-called sneak and peek provisions in which authorities could search your place of work or residence without a warrant, without you ever knowing, based on reasonable suspicion. (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, we all know what reasonable suspicion means in, you know, in a place so mired in racism. I mean, this was sort of the legacy of the Patriot Act. And because of the widespread climate of fear, there was so little in the way of, you know, public massive opposition to something that was truly uh, quite quite terrifying. You know, I mean, I think one of the things about September 11th is that we often do recognize it as a political event, you know, an act of terrorism. But the American public doesn't typically recognize 9-11 as an economic event. Uh, We were in the grips of fear and we were taught to be singularly focused on terrorism prevention. So in this climate, you know, George W. Bush, who up until then had been the least popular president with the lowest approval ratings in a very long time, saw his approval ratings skyrocket past that of many of the past presidents up until then. And with this newfound approval rating, it became possible for him to push through things like the Patriot Act, but also wide-reaching economic reforms that benefited the ruling class. You know, uh, tax cuts, bailouts for, you know, airline executives. Um, These kinds of things were just missed by the American public because we were told to be in the grips of fear. Uh, I remember the climate um, at the time of September 11, 2001. I was young, I was a college student, and I was really disturbed and upset by what I was seeing at the time. And people looked at you like a crazy person if you even tried to have these conversations because it was, well, but don't you want to get the terrorists? You know, and that was as far as sort of the mainstream conversation was allowed to go. Without, beyond that, you were branded a traitor. You were branded a utopian. Uh, you were branded impractical. If you tried to raise any kind of, you know, critical concerns about what was happening with the security state, what was happening with the military industrial complex, complex, what was happening economically in this country. There was simply no room to talk about it. Yeah, it was a tough period uh, for sure. And, you know, as an organizer at that time with the Answer Coalition and those who were trying to resist, we did start to see a little bit of daylight open up in 2002 after the Israeli invasion, uh, reinvasion of the West Bank. We called a demonstration on on the 20th of April, and 100,000 people came out. And we had on our placards at that time, free Palestine, no war against Iraq. Now, that was the beginning of what the U.S. government would start to do to roll out the invasion of Iraq. We knew it was coming. Uh, Andrew Card, who was George W. Bush's chief of staff, Uh, announced right after Labor Day that the U.S. was going to take care of business in Iraq. And people said, like, what just happened? What happened between June and and September, early September? And Card said, well, you never roll out a new product in the summer. It's always after Labor Day. And the new product in this case was the war against Iraq. And, you know, at first there was huge opposition to the idea that there would be another Vietnam-like war in a third world country thousands of miles away. 
On October 26, 2002, we had a demonstration of 200,000 that started at the Vietnam Memorial. And then on January 18th, we had 500,000. On February 15th, 2003, there were 10 million people all around the world in mass protests against Iraq. And the, the U.S. government had a problem because the, the American people at that point were, had become very skeptical. Their, their skepticism about George W. Bush returned. As you said, before September 11th, on September 10th, 2001, he was the most unpopular president ever. And on September 12th, he had a 90% approval rating. But it started to it started to sort of go away. It started to show signs of cracking. But then it was the U.S. media. And when I talk about the U.S. media, I'm not talking about Fox News or the Republican oriented media. It was CNN, MSNBC, every network uh, went on on the war path, so to speak, with the Bush administration selling the idea that Iraq a Muslim country, or predominantly Muslim, was sort of in league with Al-Qaeda. And that they, in fact, were even more dangerous than Al-Qaeda uh, because Saddam possessed weapons of mass destruction. Unlike Al-Qaeda, Saddam probably had nuclear weapons. And so this campaign, this drumbeat, was nonstop from February until March 19, 2003, when the U.S. starts the shock and awe invasion of Iraq. And I want to ask you about that because, again, they couldn't really make a, a convincing or persuasive argument uh, about Iraq and about Saddam if they told the truth, that it had been a hobbled country, it had been sanctioned for 13 years, you know, it had been inspected 13,000 times. And obviously, they couldn't tell the truth about Saddam's relationship with Al Qaeda because it was a relationship of hostility. The Baathists were a secular, pan Arabist political movement. You could have lots of differences of opinion with Saddam Hussein or the Iraqi Baathist Party. But one thing you could not credibly assert was that they were in league with Al Qaeda. In fact, they were the enemies of Al Qaeda and their political representatives inside of Iraq. But I want you, if you can help, again, especially for younger folks who might not have been old enough or aware enough at that time, to talk about what was the role of, Islam, of Islamophobia or hostility or animus or hatred against Muslims for the sort of gathering of support finally for the Iraq war. Well, Brian, you are introducing nuance to a conversation that was meant to remain black and white. You're either with us or with the terrorists. And here you are talking about how Saddam Hussein um, was actually opposed to the forces uh, of al-Qaeda, um, forces like that where you know he was, he was fundamentally opposed to in, in his political career. Um, and this, again, was a conversation that was not really allowed um, in American sort of public discourse at the time. Uh, the whole history of Iraq and sort of U.S. involvement in Iraq stretches well before even the first Gulf War. I mean, uh, people talk about how Saddam Hussein was sort of a key ally to the United States for decades. And I think that's understating it because I think the fact of the matter is the U.S. was responsible for Saddam Hussein's uh, political career in key ways. I mean, he he offered the U.S. the chance to kind of squash the political progressive ambitions of a nation um, sort of that uh, at a particular moment in history could have, for instance, uh, nationalized their oil reserves. And we know what happened when the people of Iran did that next door. So, you know, the, the history of uh, the U.S. in Iraq is one of empire building. And again, that is something we in America are simply not allowed to talk about. In anthropology, we speak of social silence. Uh, social silence being, you know, a society that doesn't talk about the most important features that shape it. And here in the U.S., uh, you could walk around with your ears wide open and not hear people talking about empire, not hear people talking about neoliberalism, even though these fundamentally shape our everyday lives in really profound ways. Um, so, you know, the, the the widespread protest movements we saw in 2003 leading up to the U.S. invasion of Iraq were really remarkable because they spoke to a public um, you know, that was calling BS, frankly, on some of the justifications that were given. And of course, as you, as you said, you know, Bush's approval rating started to dip around this. And what did the political establishment do but trot out 
Colin Powell to the United Nations to deliver uh, what he knew at the time were falsehoods about Saddam Hussein's uh, weapons program. But at the time, you know, uh, America was quite busy painting the American political establishment, busy painting Saddam Hussein as, you know, Hitler, as, you know, um, who, who was also um, inspired by the United States, right? But painting uh, Saddam Hussein as the boogeyman, as this kind of singular evil. And I, I remember a, uh, an interview uh, where Donald Rumsfeld appeared on CNN and they dusted off this old footage of him in Iraq in the 1980s, palling around with Saddam Hussein, giving him the golden cowboy spurs as a gift from Ronald Reagan. And Rumsfeld is like, oh, shoot, where did you guys find this? Because at that time, he is devoting all of his energies to convincing the American public that this man is singularly evil. Um, and it's this kind of amnesia. I mean, it's this kind of amnesia that is the raw material for American militarism. We, you know, we in the U.S. are, a, we're not just forgetful, we are made to be forgetful. There is an imperativeness to, our, to us forgetting sort of a, the geopolitical past that, that shapes global relations. And I think a, even a brief look at Iraq uh, sort of reveals that. And so your question about Islamophobia and the Iraq war is a really important one. I mean, war and racism are intimately connected uh, because the Al-Qaeda attackers were Muslim and because Iraq is predominantly Muslim and Arab. Uh, you know, for the American public, that's simply enough of a linkage right there. But that linkage was kept alive in very deliberate ways. You know, I did a study a couple of years ago of people too young to remember September 11, 2001. A fifth of my respondents thought Saddam Hussein was behind the attacks. So mm. this legacy remains alive in our collective memory. I mean, the U.S. established a, a detention center in Iraq uh, called Camp Buka, named after a 9-11 fire marshal. Uh, why would you name a prison in Iraq after someone who perished on 9-11 when Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11? Um, so these are the kind of, you know, um, false connections that were not just made, but remain alive today in sort of the American consciousness that Iraq is somehow just sort of nebulously guilty of something. Um, at the very time that the attacks took place on September 11, 2001, uh, Howard Stern was on the radio and he talked about, you know, he stopped his show to start talking about the attacks. And he said, well, this is it. We got to kick the towel head bastards out of this country. Let's do some atom bomb hits and then we can take the oil for ourselves. I mean, this is minutes after the attacks and he's already articulated Bush's foreign policy, <laughs> right? And so um, racism is part and parcel of American war making, as is this kind of necessary forgetfulness. Very, very important. You know, Gore Vidal used the formulation, the United States of amnesia. I'm glad you raised the issue of Donald Rumsfeld. He was Reagan's special envoy to the Middle East. He actually met with Saddam the day after the world learned that Iraq was using chemical weapons against Iranian soldiers. And, and he's, he's hugging him. He's meeting Saddam at the presidential palace and he's hugging Saddam, 1983. Uh, so you're quite right that the cynical nature of U.S. foreign policy, you know, in, in the case of the Iran-Iraq war, the U.S. promoted and, and supported Iraq's invasion of Iran. Iran had just had a revolution that toppled the, uh, the U.S.-imposed dictator on the Iranian people, the Shah, who had been in power for 26 years. Um, Henry Kissinger said, well, we want both of them to kill each other meaning we're going to support both sides politically more with Iraq than Iran. But they ended up, as we learned from the Iran-Contra scandal, that the U.S. was actually giving arms and intelligence to Iran as well. So, you know, this, this manipulation of um, public moods and public sentiment, it's, we, see the, we see this sort of as an ever-present part of American policy. And as you've pointed out, and as your book points out, uh, there's a fine line between tr traditional anti-black white supremacy and racism and the racism that's directed against uh, Arab people, South Asian people, and generally speaking, Muslim people. I'd like to talk, if we could, for a moment about what happens and how this impacts U.S. military personnel, because we just know from what happened in Iraq, that so many war crimes were committed by U.S. military personnel, 
We saw it as the last act of the U.S. government's war in Afghanistan that the U.S. killed an entire family with a drone strike. And if it hadn't been for a lot of media attention on Kabul that week following the, the bombing, the, the bombing that killed 13 U.S. Marines in, at the airport in Afghanistan, nobody in the United States would know about that attack because the U.S. would just wipe out a family. And it was like, no big deal. And, you know, the same thing, the New York Times just had this breaking story about uh, U.S. military personnel called in major bombs, like 2,000-pound bombs and 500-pound bombs on a group of almost exclusively or exclusively women and children who were huddled in northeastern Syria against the Euphrates River. They couldn't go anywhere. So the U.S. just called in airstrikes and destroyed all of them. And when we talk to and have been organizing, again, as anti-war organizers, U.S. soldiers, sailors, and Marines, who many of whom turn against the war, the thing that they, that they point out the most, the thing that turned them against the U.S. military was not only the brutality of these occupations, not only the bestiality of these wars of occupation, but the profound and accepted racism whereby the occupied people are treated uh, in such a dehumanizing way. And as a consequence, anything you did against the occupied people who are, you again, using all of the same racist lingo that was employed, uh, it makes it okay. It makes it okay in the minds of the perpetrators of these kind of war crimes. Let's just talk a little bit about how this impacts U.S. military personnel. Because on one hand, the American people are always told, we're going to war to liberate somebody. We're going to go to war to liberate the Kurds. Or, you know, we're going to go and liberate civilians in Libya. But then when you think about or hear about how the U.S. military actually talks about the people who are supposedly being liberated, it's so revealing. Yeah, and when we don't liberate them with warfare, we liberate them with economic sanctions that prevent them from accessing, you know, the basic necessities of life. So, so that's some model of liberation that we have there. You know, I mean, this question of militarism that you're raising is such a, an important one. Um, militarism is a behemoth. I mean, when we speak of the, what, $800 billion on just the, you know, formal military apparatus alone, um, that is a remarkable figure. I mean, when we compare it to what we spend on, you know, our social services in this country, uh, it is remarkable. And we have to draw a direct connection there that the expansion of the military industrial complex is intimately connected to the disinvestment in our lives. Uh, that connection absolutely has to be made. And when we're speaking of militarism, American militarism, we're not just talking about the formal apparatus of the military. We're talking about all of the sort of informal cultural and political systems that exist surrounding it. So I'm thinking, for instance, about how both the Department of Defense and the CIA have offices who are in charge of sort of Hollywood who are in charge of television and film, um, reviewing films that may or may not be about, you know, war. Uh, it, it may be something as banal as, you know, an episode of Jeopardy or an episode of like Ice Truckers that is uh, vetted by the U.S. state. I mean, if this happened in any other country, the U.S., the New York Times would be publishing articles about, you know, this repressive authoritarian country over there, that you go to an NFL game and you see a flyover of a, a American Air Force equipment, state-of-the-art equipment at a sporting event. Um, you know, if you get to the movies before the previews start, you're going to see two or three recruiting ads. Uh, so militarism is this giant beast that is in places we may not even know about. I mean, my students are always stunned to learn about the colonial relationship that the U.S. maintains, for instance, with Guam or with American Samoa. Places that have effectively been turned into military bases by the U.S. I mean, a lot of Americans don't know that the U.S. maintains almost, you know, 800, at least 800 uh, military bases around the world, military bases that inspire, um, you know, rousing protests from the people who live around them, uh, asking for them to be shut down. Not one foreign country has a military base on U.S. 
soil. Um, that you know that 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 the people who fight often on the very front lines of American wars are typically you know often working class. They're people of color. They are even often undocumented immigrants or people who are U.S. nationals but not full U.S. citizens because they come from those territories that the U.S. maintains effectively as colonies. Um, so, you know, the, the military industrial complex is intimately connected to the disinvestment from our lives that has been steadily intensifying now over decades. Dr. Kazi, one last question. Here you have the United States using Muslims in this caricatured, stereotype, and racist presentation as a pretext and as an organizing tool for endless war. Now the U.S. has suddenly adopted a new slogan, which is not the war on terror, but major power conflict with the People's Republic of China. Now, on its face, one might come to the the conclusion that this is a form of insanity. Uh, The U.S. could not beat the Taliban in Afghanistan, but the idea of going to war against China with 1.4 billion people and the second biggest economy seems crazy. But the U.S. always needs an enemy. U.S. militarism needs a big enemy to justify these big military expenditures. In the case of China, one of the reasons the U.S. appears to be ready to go to war is to defend the rights of minority peoples and the rights of Muslims living in Xinjiang, in the, in the western part of China, the Uyghurs. Uh, it's, it's kind of mind-blowing that the United States can wage endless war against Muslim countries and Muslim people and, and promote this racism and then turn almost on a dime and, and say, well, we, we might have to go to war now to help Muslims. And, and in 1999, when the U.S. destroyed the last socialist government in Eastern or Central Europe, Yugoslavia, it was to help Muslims. It was to help the Kosovar minority population, in, which is a, a province of Serbia. Let's just talk about how we have to also think about this anti-Muslim propaganda in sort of a, sort of a holistic way because the U.S. government is able to shift and change its political presentation without regard to what some people might think, well, that's obviously ridiculous. How could the U.S. government suddenly be the champion of Muslims when it has this track record? But nonetheless, it's done. And the media, because it functions as an echo chamber, it starts to resonate. And you see that even among progressive people who are now like, yeah, we have to do something about China to defend Uyghurs. Anyway, I know we're running out of time, but I'd like you to just comment on this obvious uh, hypocrisy or double standard, if you would. Yeah, it is such a cynical ploy, and I'm so happy that you that you raise it. I mean, uh, you know, I was really stunned a couple of weeks ago in the classroom. Uh, we were talking about, um, you know, U.S. foreign policy, and I asked a classroom of about 40 students, you know, who, who's Julian Assange? Not one of them could tell me. Um, mm. But a remarkable number of them were talking about, you know, human rights violations perpetrated by China and Xinjiang. So I I was, you know, I inquired a bit further. This is sort of a a lower level class in the university here. So a lot of these are freshmen and sophomores. And they said they had lessons in their high school social studies classes about China, which tells us about sort of the mechanisms of propaganda that are hard at work here, preparing for what you correctly call a really terrifying major power conflict that would really, you know, leave us in a, in a horrible position, um, that these, these kind of mechanisms of, prop, of propaganda are hard at work, certainly in Muslim American spaces. I mean, if you were to think about who would be the most sort of natural critic of uh, America's foreign policy, uh, Muslim Americans would be perhaps one of the most easiest populations there because of the ways in which uh, they and their loved ones abroad perhaps were impacted by the war on terror. Uh, And now you have this very cynical plot to sort of uh, shift the vision to talk about, you know, China's human rights violations, its mistreatment of uh, Muslim minority populations. This is being touted by the very country that set up a Muslims-only torture camp at Guantanamo Mm -hmm. Bay. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to see through this 
um, to see through this ploy. Um, so it is, it is really troubling. It is something we have to be very attentive to. Um, but, you know, it, I, find it, I find it really uh, hysterical when, you know, the seats of U.S. empire talk about the imperialist policies, you know, of, of China. Uh, it's, it's really remarkable. Yeah, almost every member of Congress and in, in the Senate are are crying these giant crocodile tears for the Muslims in China. Uh, Dr. Nazia Kazi was our guest. She is an activist, a professor of anthropology at Stockton University. She's the author of the book Islamophobia, Race and Global Politics. There's a new edition out. Uh, Dr. Kazi, how can people get your book? Uh, ask your local library to get it. And if not, it's available wherever you get books. Thank you so much. This has been the Socialist Program, where we bring you news and views about the world for those who want to change it. If you enjoyed the show, subscribe on your favorite podcast app and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. We can only continue our work bringing you high-quality news, analysis, and history with the support of our listeners. Connect with us and become a patron at patreon.com forward slash The Socialist Program and receive an invitation to participate in an exclusive monthly seminar with me and other fans of this show. Music